Hello and welcome to Canada's History Spring Webinar Series. This series revolves around visual history and over the past few months we have heard from educators, public historians, and graphic designers and they will continue to speak about their experiences using visuals to share Canadian history. My name is Jessica Knapp and I am your host for the series. Over the next hour, Scott Chandler will discuss the historical research he did for two of his publications, which are Northwest Passage and Two Generals. But before we begin today's presentation, I would like to provide you with a quick introduction to Canada's National History Society. Canada's history is dedicated to promoting greater popular interest in Canadian history, principally through publishing, education, and recognition programs. If you are interested in knowing more about our, knowing more about or subscribing to our flag, flagship publications, Canada's History Magazine and Kayak Canada's History Magazine for Kids, please click on the links on the screen and save them for later. If you are watching this on YouTube, you will not be able to click on the links on the screen and you will only just pause the video. Uh, you can head to canadashistory.ca for more there. If we, we are accepting both nominations and applications for the Governor General's History Awards for Excellence in Community Pro Programming. If you are part of or know of a great community event, activity, or programming that commemorates important aspects of our heritage, please consider nominating or applying for this award. The deadline for applications is June 30th, 2016. So you have almost a, an entire month to get that together. And the application is quite hefty and requires two uh, letters of reference, so the sooner you start, the better. A few reminders for today. Um, to ensure the best experience possible is to close down any unnecessary programs, a big one being Photoshop. I have closed mine down, so I recommend you consider it also. Uh, however, if there are issues, I am recording today's webinar and it should be available on our YouTube channel in the next few days. And if you have registered, you will receive an email when it becomes available. And if you haven't registered, you could always send me your email uh, in the chat box and I can add you to the list if you would like. If you are on social media, as I mentioned, you are welcome to spread the word about our conversation tonight, whether that's sending the link for the chat room or, or bringing parts of our conversation to the web and having a larger discussion there. We definitely encourage that. Our Facebook and Twitter links are on the screen there. You're welcome to use them if you haven't found us already. And um, the chat box is in the bottom right hand corner. Uh, very simple to use as most of you have sorted it out. You are encouraged to ask, ask questions at any time um, and if you do think you have to leave a bit early please get your questions in beforehand and uh, you can find out the answers to those questions in the recording in a few days. So a little bit about Scott before we begin. He started his career uh, creating visual art for a Fortune 500 companies. In 2000, he continued his work as a freelancer and branched out into the comics industry, first as a pioneer in, web com in the webcomic scene, then with a publication of his first graphic novel, Days Like This, with writer Jay Torres. He did His first solo work was Northwest Passage, which we will talk about today. More recently, his work has been embraced by mass market book publishers with Kids Can Press, a staple of the children's book scene, releasing his all ages fantasy adventure series, Three Thieves, which we will not be talking to about today too much, um, and Canadian literary institution, McClelland and Stewart, publishing his graphic memoir, Two Generals, which was based on his grandfather's experiences in the Second World War. Uh, it was named one of Chapters Indigo's Best Books of 2010 and listed by readers in CBC Canada Reads True Stories as one of the top 40 Canadian nonfiction books of all times. And Northwest Passage and Two Generals have received 
a series of nominations for various awards in, in that field. In 2010, Scott was featured on the October 2010 cover of Canadian literary magazine Quill and Choir. In 2012, he was a guest speaker at TEDx Waterloo. And in 2015, he was appointed Writer-in-Residence at the University of Win Windsor, which um, is the first cartoonist to be honored by a Canadian university in that way, which is very exciting both for Scott and, uh, and the University of Windsor. So at this point, I am going to stop sharing my PowerPoint presentation and bring up Scott's. And I welcome Scott to turn on his microphone and engage with everybody. Um, all right, microphone is on. Video is on. I don't we lost your video and audio. Nope, can't hear you. Can anybody else hear Scott? Self? Hold on. Better? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, good. I think when my video went out, it muted my microphone automatically. Okay. Well, hopefully that's all the uh, technical uh, nonsense we'll have to deal with. Everyone can hear me okay? I hope. Okay, good. I'm just going to... Uh, I'm going to... Uh, plow in here and assume everyone can see and hear me. I've only done one of these webinar type deals before, uh, but hopefully it'll work. Um, I can't hear myself, which makes it odd, but it's all right. I assume I, I sound good. Um, so uh, Jessica mentioned, uh, that was a very good introduction, by the way, very uh, thorough. Thank you, Jessica. Um, my first book was Days Like This which um, was with Jay Torres, who's a friend of mine, a comics writer. Um, and this was my first book, and, uh, you know, uh, I, I kind of got into historical subjects right away. It was about um, a, a girl group of singers in the, uh, in the early 60s. My second book, which I uh, also drew uh, with writer Jay Torres, was called Scandalous, and it was about... Um, a pair of rival gossip columnists in Hollywood in the 50s, sort of the McCarthy blacklist era. Uh, so, you know, historical subjects again. Um, the first book Jessica mentioned that I wrote myself was called Northwest Passage, which is a historical adventure set against the Canadian fur trade in the 18th century. Um, Northwest Passage is the first book I'm going to really talk about because it's the first one where I really, you know, since I wrote it myself, I was really doing a lot of the research myself. It was inspired by um, two of Peter C. Newman's books, which, you know, if you're hanging out on the uh, Canada's History website, you, uh, you, you probably have read or, or at least know of. Um, he wrote a whole series of books about the Hudson Bay Company. Uh, the first two were Company of Adventurers and Caesars of the Wilderness. Um... They uh, struck me as being a really great, um, you know, the fur trade struck me as being a, a terrific, uh, you know, setting for a, you know, adventure story in Canada. Those first two books that I'd done with Jay, you know, obviously were, were kind of set in sort of mid-century American uh, settings. I really wanted to do, you know, something Canadian, uh, you know, after that and for the first thing that I, I wrote for myself. And, uh, and this always struck me as sort of Canada's version of the Wild West, you know, the, the way that Americans sort of mythologize their frontier history with, you know, uh, six guns and, and, uh, and uh, you know, hats. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, th th this, was, this would be sort of the Canadian equivalent. You know, I, I pitched it as a sort of Canadian Western, um, you know, in that I, you know, I didn't want it to be, you know, straight, uh, historical material, but I wanted it to, you know, have a, a, a sort of a mythic, uh, 
quality, you know, uh, you know, like some of the, I wanted to have some of the romance that, you know, some of the paintings that you see in the National Archives have of, you know, just, you know, these, you know, like I say, it's kind of, it's canoes instead of horses, but it has a, a you know, a, a, a sort of a, you know, Wild West kind of a mythic, you know, age of exploration kind of feel, which, uh, you know, I thought, like I say, it would be a great uh, context for an adventure story and a unique, a unique way of, of approaching, uh, you know, Canadian history, certainly. So, you know, some of the research, you know, when you're researching an era that takes place before photography was invented, you know, you're relying on a lot of other, um, uh, you know, artists' interpretations. You know, you're going from paintings, you're going from old drawings and stuff, which, you know, a lot of my, because I do comics, I was going to have to draw a lot of this stuff, you know, that, that's, uh, we'll get into that with two generals as well, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a whole different level of research, really, is you got to, you know, figure out what all this stuff looked like, you're not just writing about it, you're also drawing about it, um, so yeah, you know, I got into a lot of, you know, yeah, like I said, digging around in a lot of other artists' uh, work, to, uh, you know, kind of see what that looked like. And, you know, not just things like details of, you know, details of the trading posts and the forts, and stuff like that, but also, you know, sort of the day-to-day, -day, you know, business of, of what happened at the forts. You know, you got a lot of, a lot of these type of uh, images, which are cool. The visual, you know, uh, a lot of C.W. Jeffries, who... Uh, here, I'm going to pull up the little pointer, which I've been shown how to use. A lot of you may be familiar with, uh, with Jeffries. Just, uh, you know, did a, a terrific number of, of drawings, uh, you know, of, uh, of Canadian historical, uh, you know, stuff. And, you know, his stuff has that, you know, it's historical, but it also has that kind of lush romantic kind of feel that I was going for. So I looked at his stuff a lot. Um, so that kind of translated into, uh, you know, this is a, this is a panel from Northwest Passage, which, uh, you know, I like us trying to, you know, make these guys seem sort of bigger than life, you know, barrel chested, a lot of low camera angles, <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, I, I, you know, like I say, it's not necessarily supposed to be strictly historical. I, I, I took a lot of crap from a particular blogger, a historical blogger about the beard on this, this is the main character in Northwest Passage, Charles Lord, and, you know, I took a lot of abuse from, from this one guy, like I said, about how a English gentleman in this period would not be wearing a beard. You know, that's, uh, that's anachronistic, I guess, but, um, you know, in terms of the story, he's an explorer who's sort of been forced into a, into a desk job at one of the forts, as, as the governor of one of the forts, and, and so, you know, I, I wanted him to be you know, I wanted a, a sort of a contrast between, you know, he's a, you know, rugged he-man who's kind of been straight-jacketed in this waistcoat, and, and uh, I think this image sort of, you know, gets that across really well. It, uh, it, it bugged the historical purists, however. But like I said, that wasn't necessarily the nature of, of Northwest Passage, not exactly what it was intended to be, although I did want to, you know, I wanted to get the history right enough to be convincing, you know, but not enough to, you know, get in the way of, of some of the storytelling. Uh, the book we're going to talk a lot more about is Two Generals, which, um, you know, I mean, I guess it's similar to Northwest Passage. It's, it's a sort of an outgrowth of, of Northwest Passage in that it's Canadian and uh, historical based, but it's... Um, Unlike Northwest Passage, it's a lot more, uh, I mean, it's nonfiction, um, you know, and, it, and it's a lot more, you know, concerned with historical detail. Um, the book, uh, sounds like I've got a couple of fans among the uh, participants, which is nice. Um, if you've read the book, you know it's about my grandfather, Law Chandler, and his real-life experiences in the Second World War. Uh, this is him as I knew him. This photo was taken... Uh, sometime in the early 90s, I guess. This is how I remember him. Um, but this is him in 1943 when he was a young lieutenant and platoon commander with the Hilo Light Infantry of Canada, which was based in uh, Cambridge, Ontario, 
not far from where I live now in Waterloo. And, you know, I, I'm going to run you through some of the history of who my grandfather was and what he did in the war, and then we're going to talk about sort of my research process and how I put all the stuff together, and then at the end we'll, um, you know, talk about how sort of that translates into, into comics form and into the book. Um, but my grandfather had a, a best friend named Jack Chrysler. He was the best man at my grandparents' wedding. That's him on the right. Um, and he was, uh, he was a couple years younger than my grandfather, but, uh, you know, they were, you know, similar age. Um, uh, Jack was also a, a lieutenant and platoon commander in the Highland Light Infantry. I never in my research figured out how they met, um, but, uh, you know, I assume, you know, they, they might have just, my, my grandfather was from St. Thomas, Ontario. Jack was from closer to Toronto way. So I always assumed that they sort of met at the regiment because they were, you know, uh, same rank and did a similar job and, and so on. But I can't verify that, so you'll notice it's not actually part of the book. <laughs> um, my grandfather and Jack shipped out in March of 1943 um, to go to England to train for the eventual invasion of Normandy on D-Day. And uh, this is a, a photo of the two of them from that year and a half of training that I really uh, like. It's a, First of all, it's a good picture of the two of them. They're part of one of the Highland regiments, like I say, so they've, uh, you know, got the kilts going. Um, get a little bit of details of the, of the camp there behind them and the English countryside. So, I mean, it's a nice photo to begin with, but um, on the back, my grandfather had written just an informal shot of the two generals, which, uh, you know, was a little joke, a little self-deprecating joke. Uh, like I said, they were junior officers. They were not generals. But... Um, you know, it's just a, you know, it's just, like I said, it's just a little joke that he dashed off on the back of this photo when it was developed, and I'm, I'm sure he had no idea that in 70 years it would become the title of a book about him, but, uh, you know, there, there it is. Uh, my grandmother, the printing at the bottom of the photo is my grandmother's from, from after the war, and uh, like a lot of people that generation, she always was writing stuff on the back of photos, which we always thought was hilarious when we were kids. And we made fun of her a lot about it. But as, you know, anyone who's a historian of any sort knows, you're always thrilled to turn over a photo and see any kind of information on the back. So when I speak to groups of young people now, I always uh, you know, try to tell them to, you know, even if we don't print our photos much anymore, to, you know, tag, tag people on Instagram and, you know, give some information about where you were and what you were doing and so on. Uh, but I probably don't have to sell that to this crowd. So, the Highland Light Infantry of Canada went in on D-Day, um, uh, June 6, 1944. This is a photograph of, uh, of the regiment landing at Juno Beach. Uh, you will see, I get a lot of, um, a lot of people who have read the books are, are always surprised about the bikes. There's a lot of... Um, yeah, because you don't see it in a lot of American war movies, because the American infantry didn't have these. But the idea was they'd, you know, carry these flimsy paratrooper bikes into combat, and after the beach was taken, they'd ride inland and start taking over towns inland. Didn't work that way at all, of course. They, uh, one veteran told me they didn't ride those bikes 200 yards, because, uh, you know, by the time they got to the um, you know, by the time they got to the beach and passed it, you know, all of the knocked out vehicles and stuff on the roads and broken glass just kind of shredded the tires, and and, uh, and that was that. Um, so uh, my grandfather's regiment was part of the first wave on D-Day, but they weren't part of the, the kind of assault force that took the beach. Like I said, they were kind of supposed to come onto the beach and ride through that, ride through those assault forces and start taking over towns and land. Uh, like I said, it didn't quite happen. But uh, because they weren't part of that first assault, uh, they didn't actually do too badly on D-Day. The regiment only actually only lost a single man on D-Day, which you know was terrible for that guy and his family. But uh, certainly, certainly nothing compared to what some of the other regiments experienced. The um, the Highland Infantry did have a really rough go of it about a month later in a small French town called Buron, which. In my research, I found 
some pictures taken before that battle and some pictures taken after that battle. This was the only one I found taken during that battle. It's of a uh, Canadian messenger taking cover behind a tree. And, uh, and the more you learn about the battle, he's right to be taking cover. It was uh, a pretty, pretty terrible day for this particular regiment. The regiment was actually cut in half in a single morning trying to take this town. Uh, this is a picture of Buran after the battle. Uh, some villagers, uh, you know, returning. As you can see, they're not going to find much. It, uh, you know, there actually wasn't a building in the village left standing at the end of the of the battle. Here's another picture taken after the Battle of Buran. Uh, my grandfather led a platoon of 36 men into the into the village that morning. And, uh, and this is what was left after. Uh, yeah, not, not that many. There are 15 men in this photo. Um, two, were, two were guys from uh, another platoon who just happened to be around. So 13. Uh, 13 uh, is, is how many men my grandfather had left at the end of this one morning of fighting. 13 out of 36. So his, uh, yeah, his platoon was uh, yeah, like two-thirds, lost two-thirds of his men during this battle. Uh, pretty pretty rough. On the back of this photo, I don't show it in the presentation, but my grandfather also made note of um, the names of these guys, which was nice, um, and made little notations about what happened to them all uh, for the rest of the war. So of the 13 men in this photo that were his men, um, I believe it was five were killed during the rest of the war, five were wounded during the rest of the war, and uh, and two suffered from battle exhaustion, what we now call uh, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder. So yeah, one really one <laughs> out of uh, out of his platoon, uh, that that platoon that he led into Buran, really kind of made it through the war with all of his you know uh, you know physically and mentally intact. Uh, yeah, this this regiment saw a lot of action and was on the front lines for a lot of the war. Uh, this is the picture I showed you of my grandfather in 1943. This is before going into combat. This is um, this is him just two years later in 1945. Uh, which, when I saw the dates on these photos uh, and you know put them side by side like this, I was I was kind of amazed. Um, you know, even for the survivors, uh, you know, just think of the amount of stress it would take to put that many lines on this face in just two years. Um, yeah, it kind of, you know, what what happens in that white space in between uh, was the Second World War. So, uh, yeah, just I, I find those two pictures side by side really, really tell a story if we're talking about visual storytelling. So my grandfather died in 1997, and like a lot of... Um, like a lot of people of my grandparents' generation who came through the Depression and the Second World War, um, you know, they, uh, you know, kind of never threw anything away. They were sort of pack rats. They never knew when the next big world-changing crisis was going to happen. Um, so cleaning out their house once they were both gone was quite a, I kind of describe it as like cleaning out the back room at a museum. Um, you know, it was uh, a lot of work. My parents mostly were the people who took that on. Um, you know, I can't claim too much credit for some of this stuff, but um, I did go around and um, gather up some of the war era stuff just because I wanted to make sure it, we didn't lose track of it and because, um, you know, I thought it should all kind of be kept together. I, I didn't want it to get all scattered to the four winds. I was definitely not thinking about doing a, a book at this point. Like I said, I was just kind of hoping to make sure that, uh, you know, some of this stuff didn't, uh, didn't disappear. Um, so there were certain things that I knew exactly where they were, like his helmet, you know, was, uh, you know, I knew exactly that where that was hanging in their basement. They'd lived in the same house since the Second World War, and, you know, this helmet had been hanging down there the whole time. My dad and his brothers used to put it on to, you know, play G.I. Joe when they were kids, and, you know, my brother and I did the same. Um, so, you know, I knew, you know, I knew where to scoop that up. Um, and there were, you know, other obvious things like his medals, uh, you know, those are something we you know, didn't want to lose track of. 
But there were also less obvious things. Like I came across this map um, of England, and I knew right away that you know there was only one time in his life my grandfather was ever in England. Uh, so I knew you know uh, what era this must have been bought in. And uh, you know I'm an artist, and, and I like nice design and good illustration and stuff. And this has that great sort of mid-century two-color illustration. You know, you know, this is a beautiful, beautiful looking map. And that was why I first picked it up. I didn't really think much about its significance. Um, but when I got home and opened it up, I saw that my grandfather had circled all the golf courses on it, which was kind of hilarious. He uh, he loved golf until the day he died. And, uh, uh, yeah, you know, it, so it was really funny to open this and see all these little Gs. You know, every, every golf course in the south of England is circled on this map. And... Uh, the um, uh, see, but you know it, it was kind of suggestive of his experience. You know what him and the other officers you know would have been doing on their weekends while they were in England. So you know that was kind of cool. Like I said, it's a you know it's a little bit of history, not an obvious piece, but um, you know kind of kind of a neat little bit. Uh, most importantly, one of the things I found during the big house cleanout was this pocket diary, and it was in a. It was in a sock drawer, you know, kind of with his medals, you know, kind of, a, you know, kind of tucked out of the way. But um, it's a 1943 pocket diary. And I opened it up and I began to read. And the very first, um, very first entry that I opened up to was this one. It's uh, Friday, March 26, 1943. Uh, it describes how him and Jack have just arrived in England and uh, they got disembarkation leave. You know, it's a two-week journey by boat in those days to, to get to, to England. So you're, you know, worn out from travel by the time you even get there. So, uh, you know, the, you get the weekend off to, you know, go mess around before they throw you into training. And so him and Jack do what any two young guys would do. They go to London. Uh, they have, uh, you know, they, they see the sights. They see a movie. Um, I'm going to just point out the movie here. It's... Uh, Kind of hard to make out because my grandfather's printing was pretty uh, legible. But uh, uh, so Bob Hope and Betty Hutton in Let's Face It, and that was quite good, he says. Um, and then so they, you know, they go for dinner. They have a few drinks at Cumberland House, and they see the Marble Arch by Hyde Park. And then this last bit says, on the way home, we saw a woman who'd been hit by a double-decker bus. And the last line is, found out later she was killed. Uh, you know, kind of shocking way to end the diary entry there, Grampy. Um, uh, so that really stood out to me for a long time. You know, I thought, you know, well, that's kind of uh, like a lot of veterans. My grandfather didn't talk much about the war and his experiences over there. We in the family kind of knew the broad strokes of it, D-Day and so on, but, um, you know, certainly no detail. Um, and, you know, my grandfather was about 30 uh, at this point in his life, so maybe he knew better than some of the younger guys what he was getting into. Uh, but I'm sure he didn't expect, and I wouldn't have expected, that he was going to start seeing uh, corpses pretty much the minute he got off the boat. Uh, you know, this is a pretty, uh, you know, uh, you know the, the entire war, I'm sure, was quite an experience, but this is a pretty shocking start to it, uh, to have this thrown in your face uh, on the first day. So uh, that, that really stayed with me. Like I said, at this point, I was not thinking about doing a book uh, of any sort. Um, but yeah, this, this is something that you know, uh, kind of came back to me later and that we'll, we'll talk about as we go along here. So, I mean, by this point, my career in comics was already getting started. And I'd done Days Like This, and I'd done Scandalous, and I'd done Northwest Passage. And... You know, people would come over, like friends would come over, and I'd show them the diary, and I'd show them the map, and I'd show them the medals and the helmet, and, and I have things like, I have flags with bullet holes in them, I have uh, paperwork from the invasion of Normandy, I have, you know, meal tickets from the ship they took over, room assignments from the ship, and, and you know, places they would have stayed in England, I've got just a wealth of detail. You know, little bits of, you know, I've got a, you know, a small military museum in my house, uh, you know, just, you know, centered on my grandfather. And so people would come over and I'd pull all that stuff out and tell them the story, you know, that I've just kind of talked you through. 
And, you know, people who knew the work I was doing in comics and knew that I liked history and wasn't afraid of a bit of research would always ask, is this going to be your next book? And I would be like, no, you know, are you kidding me? Um, you know, I, I was really against it for, for many years uh, for a lot of reasons. You know, like I said, Mike, this was my grandfather's kind of private business that he didn't really like to talk about. Um, you know, I thought it was, you know, be very much, you know, meddling in his, you know, private stuff. Um, you know, I was younger then and, you know, in, you know, inexperienced and wasn't necessarily sure that I could do right by this kind of material. Um, and I wasn't, you know, um, like I, I wasn't sure that you could even recreate because he didn't talk about it very much. Like I said, uh, you know, I wasn't sure it would even be possible to recreate his experiences in any kind of detail. Uh, but I think over the years, just enough people suggested it. And, you know, obviously people were interested, maybe, you know, a, a little bit of distance and, and time gave me a bit more confidence. But, you know, at some point I just decided, well, maybe. So I read everything I could about the Highlight Infantry of Canada and the Battle of Huron. And I was kind of sad to learn that there wasn't really all that much. Um, there was this book, Bloody Buran, which came out in the 80s by Captain J. Allen Snowy. And it was a fairly small publisher and fairly small print run. Uh, it seemed like most of the people I knew who had it or read it were veterans of the regiment. In fact, the copy I read for my research was my grandfather's. It was one of the things that I'd taken from the house uh, after he passed away. So, <clears throat> uh, yeah, I mean, that, I mean, that made me want to do the book more uh, because I thought this, this was a battle that should be remembered and, and a regiment that, that you know, uh, suffered, obviously, and, and should be remembered for that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, we, we, I kind of started out reading sort of secondary sources and stuff, and, and there wasn't as many as I would have liked. So I started into primary sources. And one of the first things I did was to uh, give a call to the regiment, which still exists. It, uh, it merged with uh, another regiment from the region here in the 60s and became the Royal Highland Fusiliers of Canada. I think that's right. Um, but either way, they still have a ton of material and a, and a nice little regimental museum devoted to both regiments, which is terrific, run by a, a nice fellow named Sergeant Lance Harrison. Uh, you know, gave me a, uh, took me a couple calls down to the regiment to convince them to, you know, let me in. Uh, you know, it is a Department of Defense building, so they don't want people just hanging around with uh, notepads and cameras. But... Uh, you know, they eventually said, you know, I explained to them I'm a, you know, the grandson of a, I'm a, for, of a former officer, and they, uh, they decided I was all right. So, uh, you know, they invited me to come down. Like I said, they, they took me to the regimental museum and showed me a bunch of stuff. They've got all the period weapons that I was able to hold. And, you know, I'm not a big gun guy, but, you know, it's, it's uh, certainly an imposing thing to, you know, hold a, you know, uh, hold the rifle and hold the machine guns and hold the... Uh, you know, bayonets and all the other stuff that they would have done. And, you know, get a, get a sense of the weight of them and photograph them, because I knew I was going to have to draw them all a million times. And, you know, he had some of the regimental members put on the period uniforms, which, you know, again, I was going to have to draw all that, and sort of see the way the, you know, the tunic hangs over the belt and the way the pants kind of blouse over the boots and, and uh, you know, those, yeah, like I said, that kind of heavy wool sort of hangs in a particular way, uh, you know, which is one of those things you want to get right. And military people know their stuff, you know, like, I, you know, even though I come from a kind of a military family, I was never sort of into that stuff myself, but I, I know that those people know, they know exactly which hat goes with which uniform and which, you know, badge goes on which hat and, you know, that kind of thing, and if you don't get it right, they let you know. So I, I knew, you know, that kind of stuff was going to have to be well researched. Um, after I got there, they took me upstairs and to the officer's mess and pulled aside a curtain with this huge shelf of hardcover volumes that make up the regimental war diary. And, um, uh, and that was a, a terrific uh, sort of primary source. Um, you know, you kind of go through the shelf by date and you, you, you know, pick the, 
you know, giant volume down and you put it down on the desk and you flip through and the amount of information in there was amazing. I mean, there was a lot of, you know, more detail than you'd ever need, but if you were willing to kind of sort through it, there was all kinds of information, you know, daily weather reports. Um, you know, if, if, if you see it raining in two generals, I know it was raining that day. You know, that's, that's the level of information I was eventually able to, uh, uh, you know, for, for, for a guy who was worried that I wouldn't be able to find much, you know, detailed information, I actually, you know, by the end found more than I ever imagined there, there could be. Um, so that was great. So I started going through the, the Red Mental Diary. And then on that first night, one of the most amazing things in my life happened was that I'd been there for about 20 minutes. And uh, this gentleman walked in and... Uh, his name was Colonel Doug Barry, and he had been the commanding officer of the regiment in the 80s. And um, one of the reasons why was that in the 40s, he had been uh, young Lieutenant Doug Barry, who had also been uh, a, uh, a platoon commander and was a good friend of my grandfather's and Jack's, if you can believe it. Um, yeah, one of the most amazing serendipitous things that's ever happened to me. Uh, somebody had the good sense to ask him, did you know La Chandler? He said, yes. And they said, we've got his grandson up in the mess. Would you like to come say hello? And so we were introduced, and somebody brought around a couple of drinks, and uh, Colonel Barry and I sat and talked for about three hours. And, uh, and that changed the entire nature of the project for me. You know, but by this point, my grandfather was long dead, and there was, you know, I, I wouldn't even have tried the book if he were alive. Um, but, uh, you know, Colonel Barry became, you know, I was getting a lot of information, a lot of dry information out of the, um, out of the Regimental War Diary. Like I said, things, you know, orders given and weather reports and, you know, you know so-and-so was transferred from this company to that company. All that was great in terms of raw information. But Colonel Barry became the kind of research where, you know, you can ask him, you know, what it felt like, you know, to, to be doing some of those things and to be there. Um, you know, the kind of things I would have asked my grandfather were he alive. It was also nice to have somebody, you know, often, you know, if any of you do any kind of historical research, I assume you do, um, you know that, you know, you'll, you'll come across bits of information that contradict each other. And, you know, um, you know, all you can do when you're writing is make some kind of judgment call uh, about which is right or whether to pick some kind of line down the middle uh, between them. Um, but Colonel Barry would be the guy that I could call who was there, who, you know, might know, uh, you know, which of those pieces of information were right. Or, you know, if I had to make a judgment call, you know, at least I could make a, a more informed one. Uh, so anyway, that was pretty amazing. I was able to interview Colonel Barry a, a few times uh, for the book, and it was always, uh, uh, always an experience. He seemed to be one of those, a, a lot of veterans, you know, don't talk. Uh, you know, about their experiences. He seemed to be one of those who uh, sort of wanted to talk for the others, wanted to talk for the ones who couldn't talk or wouldn't talk. Uh, and, you know, it's, thankfully we have guys like that or there wouldn't be history books. So, like I said, I was finding out more information and in more detail than I ever imagined possible. Uh, something I didn't know a lot about still was Jack Chrysler, my grandfather's best friend. And, you know, who was the other uh, sort of main character in the book. Um, I, I never had any luck tracking down any of his family or anything on this side of the Atlantic. Um, uh, so I found out from the Regimental War Diary that he had actually married a, a, an English girl from Southampton um, in March of 1944, just about six weeks before D-Day. And, uh, you know, it had their address in Southampton in the, in the regimental diary. And I thought, well, okay, if I can't find him, I'll go looking for her. And um, I did all the usual stuff. You know, I searched the Internet for this and that. And, you know, uh, her name was Winifred Davidson. Uh, you, know, you know, I found a number of Winifred Davidsons in England from the time, but I had no way to confirm any of them were the one I was looking for. Um, a friend of mine from England kind of suggested a couple of websites where I could post some stuff, you, you know, uh, you know, kind of missed connections or missing persons kind of stuff. And so you'll see here, I, you know, I did that, you know, I actually, here, this is from April, 2008. 
I just got this is a long shot, but I'm going to post it anyway. And I just put what I knew about her, uh, you know, and him, which admittedly wasn't much. But um, you know, nothing came of this, and I went ahead and I wrote my script for the first draft of the book. And uh, you know, I kind of just made Jack up, um, you know, as a sort of a sidekick for my grandfather. Almost, he was not a very well fleshed out character in that first draft. Um, but uh, at, you know, at some point, I turned in that first draft to McClellan and Stewart, and I was kind of waiting to hear back from my editor, you know, with with notes. There are always notes. And uh, my email went off one day, and it was um, a woman named Jan Spears, who was the daughter of Winifred Davison who uh, was still alive and still is as far as I've uh, as far as I've heard um, but you know they had been looking for some kind of information about her mother online and had come across my uh, post and decided to get a hold of me thankfully uh, this was another really lucky break uh, for the book and um, yeah in, in the same way that I had a lot of my grandfather's stuff from the Second World War she had a lot of her mother's stuff uh, from the Second World War and so there was a big process of kind of scanning what we each had and, and emailing it to each other. And she had some great stuff. I mean, first of all, she had more pictures of Jack, which, you know, because I do, you know, comics, um, you know, I knew I was going to have to draw Jack a million times. And um, it was, uh, yeah, I mean, I really, the only pictures I had of him were that, that wedding photo that I showed earlier. And... The uh, you know official uh, army portrait that, that accompanied his uh, his obituary in a kind of a grainy 1940s newspaper. Um, so yeah, I mean it was great to have more pictures of Jack and pictures of Winifred as well because I knew you know getting married six weeks before D Day that was going to have to be in the book and she was going to have to be in the book and I didn't want to you know name her and just draw some generic looking woman. So. Um, you know, yeah, it was great to have great to have pictures of both of them, and these and these pictures are great, and, and kind of you know are suggestive of their relationship, and and uh, and you know, it's just, these were fantastic to you know just on a personal level, these were great to see, but you know, uh, for the book, they were really really important. Uh, maybe more importantly, she all had almost daily letters that Jack had written to her mother uh, uh, from from France from from the front, you know, after after he shipped out on D-Day. And these are really important to have for a couple reasons. I mean, um, like I said, in the first draft, I'd kind of made Jack up um, uh, and kind of just invented a personality for him. These let me, you know, you read somebody's personal correspondence, you get to know who they were in a hurry. Um, and, you know, I'd, I'd kind of invented this character. When you're a writer, you're always looking for contrast. So I'd... I'd uh, um, created this character for Jack where he was kind of a, you know, foil character to my grandfather, you know, who was, you know, more kind of reserved and quiet. You know, my, my Jack was a bit more of a gregarious character, uh, which turned out to be fairly accurate, actually. Um, and, uh, and, and so there's, you know, but, you know, I was able to, you know, like I say, uh, be, be a little more, uh, uh, you know, true to who Jack really was. Um, I was able to create more material for Jack. There are scenes in the book that just are transplanted right from these letters, uh, which is cool to be able to do. And um, uh, yeah, what, what else about these? Oh yeah, my grandfather's diary, uh, which I started with, you'll recall, you know, ended in, you know, it's a 1943 diary. It ends in Christmas 1943. Um, these letters of Jack's pick up in early 1944, not long after he meets Winifred. So between the diary and the letters, I have one of their personal takes on just about everything that happened. Um, you'll notice that the book, if you've read it, is kind of divided into two halves, it's sort of meant to be read in two sittings. You know, the first half is kind of the, you know, there's kind of an England half and a France half, a training half and a combat half, my grandfather's half and Jack's half. And so I think of it as kind of two halves, two generals, the whole thing has a kind of a nice uh, symmetry to it, which I like. Uh, the other thing I like to point out about this letter, so I'm going to have a tasty, refreshing beverage here, is uh, when I was putting this together the first time, my wife uh, was reading this over my shoulder, and and uh, Jack's really pouring on, you know, he's pouring it on here. He's writing to his new bride, right? He's really, you know, 
he's pulling on all the stops. And, and my wife was quite charmed by this letter. Um, and then I pointed out the date to her. Uh, here, let me pull up the arrow again. Uh, July 7th, 1944. And she started to get kind of choked up because she knows as well as I do that Jack was killed the very next morning, July 8th, which uh, is the morning of the Battle of Duran. So this is actually the last letter in that, in that chain of letters, uh, very sadly. So now that I've bummed everybody out, um, we'll move on. So as for how this all trans... I can see I'm kind of running out of time here, so I'll try to go a little quicker so we got time for questions. But um, as for how this all translates into the book and into comics form, I knew I'd be able to deal with history on three different levels. Um, and the first and the most important to me was the level of personal history. And, you know, I knew there'd be able to be scenes in my book that you've never seen in any other war story or war film or, you know, anything like that because they're particular to my grandfather's experience and to Jack's. And there's no better example of that than the um, this scene that happens early in the book uh, with the woman who's been hit by the double-decker bus. And you can see, like, I even know which, what movie they were coming out of when this happened. Bob Hope and Betty Hutton and Let's Face It. Um, you know, so, like, again, that's the level of... For a guy who didn't think he could recreate this with any sort of detail, I ended up with more detail than you could put into ten books. Um, you know, obviously I've had to invent some dialogue for them here, but I've read the letters, I've read the diary, you know, I, I can kind of, you know, hear their voices in my head. Obviously, you know, I was 25 when my grandfather died, so I, you know, I, I knew his voice fairly well anyway. So I was fairly confident in creating dialogue for them. Um, and, and you'll see there's this bit here, that I'm, I don't know how many of you have read the book, but if you have, you'll know this scene with the woman under the bus kind of leads us into a flashback where the woman's shoe on the ground becomes a little boy's shoe. And that leads us into a, a flashback about my grandfather's younger brother who, uh, when they were kids, was hit by a streetcar and he received some sort of brain damage and spent the rest of his life in an a institution, um, which I did not know when I started this project. Um, I, uh, you know, at some point while I was researching the book, someone put together, my uncle put together a, a family tree for all of us for Christmas and presented them to us. And, and I saw the name Clarence Chandler on there. And I was like, who the hell is Clarence Chandler? And so they told the story, you know, oh, that was your grandfather's little brother and he got hit by a streetcar, and etc. And as soon as I heard hit by a streetcar, my mind immediately went back to the diary and the woman under the bus. And I kind of wondered if the reason my grandfather had mentioned it in the diary, which is otherwise pretty dry information about what they're doing every day, is because the same thing happened to him in reverse. If seeing the woman under the bus kind of, you know, reminded him of what had happened to his brother. And uh, sort of the thematic connection between those two events became the book for me. Um, you know, like I said, I've tried to get all the details right about war, um, but to me this was always more a book about death, you know, about, about mortality and the fear of mortality. I've said in interviews that to me it would be largely the same book if my grandfather and his friend had climbed Mount Everest and only one of them had come back. To me, that's the story. You know, two, two go over, one come back. You know, that's the, that's the, that's the meat of it. That's the, the arc of the story. Uh, you know, the war is just kind of window dressing. I, I, I like to say that, you know, the Second World War was the streetcar that hit my grandfather. Um, another, another thing, another level of history I was able to deal with was local history. Um, you know, near where I grew up, uh, in St. Thomas, uh, in Port Stanley, Ontario, there's this, um, or was this giant dance hall, uh, that my parents, that my grandparents, sorry, uh, would have, would have, uh, hung out. They used to talk about it all the time when I was a kid, about their days dancing to, to some of the big bands and stuff there. And, uh, you know, it doesn't mean anything to people in most parts of the country, I'm sure, but, you know, people from, you know, the area where I grew up would, would recognize some of this local history, uh, which was kind of cool to include. Fun to draw some of these musicians who, you know, I, I love a lot of these guys too. Um, also, in the subject of local history, like at the end of the book, my grandfather returns to this farmhouse where my grandmother is living. And that's my old, it, this means nothing to anyone except about six people who, you know, recognize the old family farmhouse 
but you know, it's it's fun to see my dad and his brothers and, and stuff kind of. Hey, it's the old, it's the old Chandler farmhouse. You know, it's just, it's nice to put in that kind of detail that you know almost nobody appreciates, but but one or two people do. And of course, the third level of history I'm able to deal with is world history, um, and you know, because there are points in my grandfather's and Jack's story where you know they do intersect with major events in the history of the world, like D-Day. Um, so, you know, there's that, um, you know, there's that level as well. And, and, and those, you know, end up being literal big moments. This is a two page spread in the middle of the book that took about a week to draw. And, uh, and th those of you who are familiar with it may, may recognize it's based on a, on a Kenneth Bell photograph, which isn't of my grandfather's regiment, but I changed the number on the landing craft so that it could be my grandfather's regiment. I cheated a little bit. But you know I, that's just the best picture I've ever seen of the of the conditions on Juno Beach uh, during the landing. So I, I thought you know I, I'm not going to do better than that. So I'll just uh, I'll tip my hat to, to old Ken Bell here. Um, there, there's lots of bits in the book that are you know obviously you know we got the D Day and stuff, but you know there there are lots of bits in the book too that are kind of bits you don't necessarily think about. Um, like this this scene is based on. Uh, something Colonel Barry described to me about he didn't want to talk about the beach he wanted to talk about the the, the ride and the landing craft on the English Channel the morning of you know, he wanted to talk about the trip to the beach and he described this kind of hellish scene of you know the motion of the waves rocking the boat and the men crammed in there and there was no room for anybody's legs he described and everybody was smoking so the air was thick with smoke and you know plus all the smells of sweaty men's bodies and stuff plus the fear uh you know everybody's smoking the air is full of that kind of stuff um he said the diesel fumes from the ship were giving everyone a headache you know, on top of everything else, plus the fear that they're dealing with, and, you know, these are the kind of things that I think comics do really well. Um, you know, with prose, you've got to kind of fill the page with words either way, but with, with comics, you can kind of extrapolate a quiet moment from several different points of view like this, and just kind of let the reader be in it for a while. So you'll notice in two generals, there's quite a bit of that that goes on. You know, some 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 scenes are quite wordy, and other other scenes are not at all wordy. Where I, you know, I just do my best to try to put you there. Um, and you know, to me, the books are really, you know, there's 20 pages or so of pretty horrific combat at the end. But to me, it's about these kind of smaller moments and the way they kind of compound on top of each other and you know explode by the end. Uh, you know, to me, to me, it's about those smaller moments. Uh, there's some golf in the book, <laughs> obviously. I wasn't about to do a, uh, a book about my grandfather without putting golf in it. Um, like I said, smaller moments. But, uh, like I said, we do, we do follow the guys into the trenches uh, at the end, and uh, you, know, you, get, you get all that stuff, too. It gets, uh, gets pretty hairy toward the end. I try not to, uh, to shy away from, from you know, how ugly... Uh, you know, that part of it must have been. And I think I've talked long enough, and so I think I'm going to give you guys, uh, you know, a few minutes to ask some questions, because uh, you've all been very patient. So, uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's do that. <laughs> Scott, thanks for your presentation. It, um, it's a whole other layer of understanding when looking at your books, and... Uh, I definitely appreciate it, and I think everybody else here with us appreciates you taking the time as well. Uh, I know I have a series of questions, but um, I'm hoping that our participants also have some questions, and please feel free to uh, type them in and share them with us now, and, um, and we'll get to a number of them today. I think maybe we'll take 10 minutes to do maybe maybe sure. 15, uh, depending on how long people will stay with us and how long you'll stay with us, Scott. Sure, uh, hey, no problem at all. Um, so I'm just, oh, there we go, Craig, on top of it. He asks, have you been approached to do any video games? 
Uh, I've not been approached. I, uh, I've gotten very interested in video games the last uh, maybe five, six years since my kids have been... I think like a lot of people, I kind of drifted away from video games after university or so, but I, I've kind of been you know, kind of back into it now that my kids are of age where they're, they're playing a lot of games. And, and I'm really interested in what's going on with the kind of open world stuff where it's, you know, it's not really a story where the, you know, kind of player is generating. And, I, and I'm really interested in, in kind of that, you know, for storytelling, you know, kind of a, a world that's an open world. Uh, but, um, you know, where, yeah, yeah, I just, um, yeah, I, I think, I feel like video games are becoming a whole new medium and not just movies that you can control a little bit. And, and so I, I am very interested in that for storytelling. Um, but no, I haven't been I haven't been approached or haven't done any work for games or uh, or any of that kind of thing. Uh, should I just go to the next one here? Uh, Fort Edmonton Park. What was the reception in the book industry to doing Canadian history comics? Um, yeah, okay. So this is uh, I assume everyone can see Fort Edmonton Park's question about uh, the reception in the book industry. Um, Two Generals was the first graphic novel for McClellan and Stewart, who, um, you know, like a lot of publishers 10 years ago, were trying to get in on the whole graphic novel game, but maybe, you know, weren't quite sure, uh, you know, what that entailed. You know, I think, I think they thought they were going to be putting out, you know, a line sort of for children. Um, a friend of mine who works there kind of told me they were looking for projects, and I thought this might, you know, might be perfect for McClellan and Stewart, you know, who like history and like, uh, you know, Canadiana, and um, so I pitched it to them, and you know, it was clear fairly quickly that this wasn't going to go in their children's, uh, you know, catalog. Although I think it is an important book for young people to read. Um, so you know, we had to have some conversations about that and how this was going to be marketed. But when I first entered the business, history comics were considered the kiss of death. I mean, you could get laughed out of someone's office by um, suggesting you know, a historical anything. And that's, that's one of the things that's really changed in comics in the last 15 years or so is that, you know, you'll notice my career, my career has been mostly historical subjects. And uh, that is not something that would have happened even five years earlier if I'd entered, if I'd entered the business any earlier than I did. Um, so, I, I mean, yeah, it's been interesting. You know, I, I, you're asking about citing previous examples. There wasn't, you know, when I started my career, there wasn't a lot of previous examples of history comics to cite. <laughs> you know, um, that was that. But um, fortunately, uh, while I was working on Northwest Passage, Chester Brown's uh, Louis Riel came out. And as we all know, that did really well. So, you know, I took that as a good sign <laughs> that things were changing. Not that Northwest Passage is anything like Riel. I mean, you know, my book's got a lot more knife fights and stuff. Uh, you know, mine is definitely more of a Robert Louis Stevenson kind of thing than a, than a straight-up history. But, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, yeah, yeah, definitely, that's been a huge change in comics, uh, you know, in the, in the 15 years or so that I've been doing them. Um, I'm going to skip ahead here to Craig. Have you seen Valiant Hearts? Um, I haven't. I haven't. I'm not sure I even know what that is. Um, enlighten me, Craig, while I answer some other questions. Uh, Karen, could you describe what your book draft manuscript looks like? It looks very much like a script for a movie or a TV show. I wish I'd included it in the presentation. I, I had no idea that was going to be a question, but uh, I guess you can't always, uh, yeah, anticipate what the questions will be. But um, yeah, I mean, think of it, think of like a film script where it's got the characters' names and their dialogue next to it, and little little bits of description of the action in between. I usually break down things into panels and pages in my script, you know, trying to work out some of that visual rhythm and timing. But I'm not married to it. Um, once I get to the once I get to roughing out the pages, uh, you know, in pencil, you know, I'll often change my mind about a lot of the, uh, you know, timing and, and and you know the way things are framed. But I will at least be thinking about that in my script a little bit, and and you know, include some of that. You know, if something's going to be a close up or whatever, sometimes I'll put that in. Like I say, maybe I'll ignore it <laughs> when I get to the when I get to start drawing, but. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. Think of it. Think of it as like a uh, a movie script. Um, 
thanks, thanks. Uh, Valiant Hearts is an award-winning educational game. Your work reminds me of the visuals. I'll tweet you some links. Uh, please do. Please do. That sounds very interesting. Uh, I would like to take a look at that. So, Scott, I have a few questions for you myself. Um, okay, fire away. All right. Uh, so, I find when I'm doing historical research, uh, especially when um, looking at the war, that the stories are quite emotional and the the stories that you looked at were very emotional and I was wondering how does this emotion change the creation process for you? Um, like I said early on it took me years just to gear myself up to do this book and to convince myself it was all right to do it and during the entire process of it I struggled with that sense of doubt relentlessly <laughs> It was, um, you know, there are, there were definitely times when I nearly gave this up. Um, you know, I guess you eventually get past a point of no return where you've just got to finish or you've wasted a bunch of years of your life. But, um, yeah, like you said, this was very, to me, this was not just a, you know, obviously there's an amount of historical interest here. But um, I, my, my, the best reaction I get to two generals is when people tell me, uh, oh, I love two generals, the ending made me cry. Um, because then I know that they understood the book that I thought I was writing. <laughs> you know, If people tell me, oh, it was interesting, I didn't know much about Canadians in the Second World War, that's fine too. But um, if people tell me they cried, I know they understood the book the way I always understood it. Because, yeah, like this is... Um, you know, this was pretty emotional material to me. It's about my own grandfather. It's like I said, it's about you know stuff that was obviously pretty emotional to him that he wouldn't talk about. And um, you know, it's like I said, it's about death and, and you know how you deal with you know deaths of others and thoughts of your own death. And you know, it's 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 about a lot of it's about a lot of pretty emotional stuff. You know, there was a lot of uh, you know a lot of those, you know, this was a dark, this was not a fun book to do. I'm, I'm glad I did it, but, but yeah, it was not, you know, it was not what I would call fun to work on. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I don't, I don't even know how to, I don't really know how I dealt with that other than to just plow through. You know, I thought, I thought the book would be kind of worth it when it was done. And, you know, I thought people's reactions to it would be, like I said, a lot of people kind of suggested it to me, so I knew there was interest out there. Um, but yeah, I, uh, yeah, it was a long, it's about, it's about three years to do this book and, you know, work, you know, maybe probably 70, 80, sometimes 90 hour weeks during those, uh, three years. So, uh, you know, it was a, it was a big thing in my life and it, it was a long, dark tunnel that, you know, when I, when I was, when I was done, I was, I was glad to be out of that tunnel. Like I said, I'm glad I did the book, but, uh. I don't think I'm ever going back to the Second World War again. It was uh, this was really, really tough on me to do. Um, shall I go ahead to Matthew's question? Did that did that answer your question, Jessica? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. And yeah, yeah, Matthew wants to know what you have planned for the future in terms of historical topics and projects. Um, yeah, no firm plans. I just actually, you know, completely different from the kind of work we've been talking about. I actually just finished up a, a kids fantasy series called Three Thieves that I've been working on for years now, and and uh, that was fun. Like, you know, while my kids were young, I wanted to do something that they could sort of enjoy while they were young kids. But but you know, now I'm now I'm looking forward to you know getting back to doing something maybe a, at least a little more adult. Um, so I've got some pitches out there that. Um, a few of them are uh, historical in nature. Um, I don't want to talk about any of them yet because, uh, like I said, I, I haven't got a green light on any of them. I'm enjoying a little bit of time off right now, which is the first time in many, many years that I've done that, not had a, a deadline to, to deal with, uh, which I'm enjoying. But yeah, at some point I'm going to, you know, try to try to get uh, try to get another project going. And uh, most of the most of the pitches that are either out there or that I'm uh, you know, intending to write, uh, you know, have some sort of historical angle. So maybe we can do this again sometime. <laughs> Excellent.
Excellent. I just want to say to those that are in the room with us that I sent the link to the feedback survey in the chat room. So please take a few minutes after today's webinar and complete that. I'm just going to ask Scott a few more questions. You're welcome to stay in the room and listen. I just think they would be great for uh, resources in the future. Um, so if that's okay with you, Scott. That's perfectly all right. People should hang out and uh, listen to these. Okay, excellent. And uh, in the, those in the room, you're welcome to continue asking questions as these move along as well. Um, so I would like to ask, what kind of responsibility do you think graphic novelists and artists have to depict history accurately? Well, I mean, that's an interesting question. I mean, it, it, it varies from project to project, even in my own career. Uh, you know, like I said, it's... Um, you know, with Northwest Passage, I, I didn't, you know, because it was a thing where I was, you know, purposefully trying to mythologize a bit, you know, um, you know, I didn't feel that beholden to, you know, um, you know, a, a great amount of detail. Like, I, I think I said, you know, I, you know, you want enough detail to be convincing, but, you know, it's mostly, mostly still about your story. Whereas with Two Generals, I really wanted to be, um, you know, to get it as right. And, you know, I, I messed up a few things, which people have pointed out to me, uh, always after the book is in print. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, the idea with Two Generals was to get it as right as possible. Uh, you know, I very much wanted it to be my grandfather's story and not mine, you know. Uh, uh, books like Mouse by Art Spiegelman, you know, it's, it's, it's as much his story as it is his, his father's story of the Holocaust, you know, it's very much about their relationship and, and contrast to their lives and such. I didn't want to go that route with two generals. You know, I, I, like I said, I wanted it to be his story and keep my junk out of it as much as possible. Um, so, yeah, I mean, even within my own career, you can see kind of two different, you know, every project has its own, you know, uh, you know maybe it's a higher priority on this project and not that one. Um, but so yeah, I mean, I you know, it's it's uh, it's it's a hard question even to answer for myself, let alone for any other uh, creators. Uh, you know, I think it really varies, uh, creator to creator and project to project. Do you have any guidelines rec or recommendations for people who are starting a project similar to this um, in terms of historical accuracy? Uh, maybe some questions they should ask themselves about their own project. Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I think the important thing for me, um, it, it, because you get really overwhelmed with research. Like I said, I didn't even know how much information was out there. And when I did, it was way more than I thought. Um, and so you've got to... You got to read all the books and, and you know comb around in archives, you know, and, 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 and find it all out. But at some point, you got to whittle it all down into you know something that's a manageable book or a manageable story. Uh, the way I did that was by deciding. I decided early on that Two Generals was about two things. It's about friendship, and it's about death. And so any piece of information I came across that spoke to either of those two themes, uh, I knew was going to be in the book. And that anything I came across that didn't speak to either of those two themes, I knew, you know, it might have been really interesting information, um, but I knew that it probably was just going to be, you know, crowding, crowding up my book. Um, so, you know, that kind of stuff hit the cutting room floor, so to speak. Um, so I, I would say, you know, as quickly as you can in, in, in your project, kind of figure out what, what your book is going to be about, you know, and, and it, it doesn't mean you should limit your research, but it will at least help you decide what, you know, what bits of info amongst your research are going to be in and what's going to be out, if that, if that makes sense. And I would also say, just as a piece of advice, don't, lose heart. It's, you know, beginning a project like this is insane. If anyone's ever written a book or researched, you know, anything, you know how daunting it can be, you know, how, uh, you, know, uh, you know, how much there, you, you really start to learn how much you don't know when you start researching a subject in any kind of detail. 
um, but you know, I would say you know you'll you'll get there. You know, don't don't uh, don't give up. You know, do the you know put put the time in and, and do the research, and you'll you'll eventually uh, you know win the win the battle. But yeah, it really can be daunting early on for sure. So in your research, you you obviously did like you just said, uh, did a lot of reading about uh, different historical topics, um, different battles in the Second World War, different experiences. Um, many of those books I, I'm taking, uh, I'm assu excuse me, assuming were text-based. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So what I want to know are what benefits do you see in telling or showing history in the graphic novel form? Well, <clears throat> I mean, you can really show it, literally, <laughs> right? You know, you can, you know, get into all that visual stuff that I talked about, which is, you know, a whole other level of stuff that you have to get right, you know, these, these uniforms and whatnot. But there's also a, um, there's, there, there's also a level at which, you know, this... This page is a good example that I talked about, about just, you know, there's no words on this page, you know, and, and I think this is a good example of something comics do well um, in terms of just, um, you know, um, it's, you know, it's not that, it's not that, you know, prose is s stiff and cold and stuff. I mean, we've all read, you know, books that have made us cry and whatnot, but um, there's a real... Um, there's a lot of meaning here. I mean, I'm, I'm going to go off on a tangent. I hope we have time for it. But you'll notice that Two Generals, if you've read it, is almost entirely, you know, these next two pages are as well, this nine-panel grid with, you know, three rows of three panels each. And I wanted to do that. I've never done that on any other book. I wanted to do it with Two Generals because it creates a, when the panels are that, identical size and shape, it creates a sort of a staccato rhythm to how you read it. Da, 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 da. Almost a military rhythm. Okay, So that creates sort of visual meaning for a book like this. Um, there's also, there's a lot of images in the books of clocks and watch faces and stuff like that. So this kind of pattern also ends up working sort of like a ticking clock. Like I said, I wanted the book to be kind of about the small moments, that year and a half of waiting and fear and so on before you go into combat. And, you know, kind of one of the tricks in comics is the more, you know, the panels represent time. So the more you divide the page up, the more you're dividing it into smaller units of time. And, you know, a panel might just be of, you know, a guy smoking a cigarette or, you know, something like that, you know, some, you know, small moment. Um, and, 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 you know, to me, that's what the book was about. So there's a lot of meaning in these visuals, um, which, you know, the reader isn't necessarily conscious of when they read it, but they sort of feel it. You know, they, they feel those things. And I think that's what comics do really well. You know, maybe that's not a great way to get away, uh, get across historical information like you suggest, although I'm certainly getting a lot of information in about, you know, what the boots look like and, and, and stuff like that. Um, but there's just a, yeah, it's a, it, I mean, it's a whole different way of telling a story where you've got, you know, you've got all of the stuff that prose gives you, but you've also got all the tools that visual art gives you, um, you know, and there's a lot of meaning in both and they can be combined in different ways to, you know, create all new sorts of meaning and, uh, and, you know, that may be a kind of a general answer, you know, I think my answer basically is that comics are great uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah there's a lot of you know a lot of potential for storytelling and and, uh, and and putting across visual information yeah I definitely see that as pretty evident in in the work that you do and it, it was more of a, a leading question which you oh, answered okay. very well thank you um, thank you very much so I have two more questions, um, and they shouldn't take much time, much more time for those of you who are wondering where we're at. Um, we, I'm a, we've got nine people holding on here. Good, good job. Good job to you nine. I'm a, a very big advocate of getting graphic novels and comics in the classroom to teach Canadian history. 
Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure you're probably there with me, and uh, this whole series is kind of about that, to, to give people the confidence that this uh, resource can do very well in the classroom and can do very well for teaching the general public about Canadian history. Um, sure. So thinking about that, what kind of, uh, and being you know, the, the author, the creator of these types of books, what advice or, or um, things to watch out for when people are, when students or people are looking at these novels, what questions should they be asking of the author or the creator, and um, how can they best use them in their classroom, from your opinion? Oh, boy, that's a big question. Um... When two generals first started being used in schools a couple of years ago, um, I was invited down to the Thames Valley Board to, um, I gave them a talk fairly similar to this one, kind of about, you know, the history of the book and how it came together and, you know, some of the visual storytelling tricks that I was using and, you know, stuff that they could impart to their classes. And then after they taught the book the first time, I went down and the teachers all presented to me about what they'd done with the book, and they were teaching it across both history, English, and art, which I thought was great. Um, and almost every teacher had done something completely different with it. You know, um, you know, some did more obvious things like you know make a little comic about you know someone in your family history and so on. Um, but, you know, other people have done just, like, I can't even remember some of the just creative ways that teachers had used the books. And and, and I think that's a great thing about comics and, and graphic novels is that, you know, there's there's a lot of disciplines there. You know, there's there's writing, there's, there's uh, you know, visual art, there's color. You know, if you're, you know, teaching art, there's, um, you know, there's, there's just a, you know, and, you know, all of the things that those fields, you know, bring. Um so yeah, I mean it's a it's a pretty broad question. I mean, you know, there's there's all sorts of ways you could teach these books or use them in the classroom. Um, you know, aside from just um, you know getting you know two generals. You know, a lot of a lot of teenagers have been introduced to the Second World War with two generals, which I'm you know I'm very happy about. Um, you know, and that that itself is a is a, a kind of a nice thing. Um, I've kind of forgotten what the question was, but what what to look for. What to look for in in graphic novels for the classroom? It's it's great that there's so much acceptance now, and particularly among teachers and librarians, are hugely on the side of comics, which is great. Uh, complete reversal from when I was a kid. Um, but um, you know, because of that, you know, a lot of publishers have kind of jumped on the bandwagon without really knowing what makes good comics or who the good creators are. And so you see a lot of graphic novels now, and, and, and particularly in the educational field, I'm sorry to say, that might be full of good information, but they're not very well done comics. They're not very good examples of, of using the medium well. Uh, I find that particularly a lot of educational graphic novels end up being just kind of heavily illustrated textbooks. Uh, you know, they aren't using, you know, again, this page that's up is a, is a good example of, you know, uh, you know, using visuals to get the information across instead of uh, just, you know, huge panels full of text with a little illustration next to it that gives you the same information the text is giving you. Um, yeah, I, I'd, I'd watch out for some of the kind of, um, you know, sort of more mediocre uh, historical graphic novels out there and, you know, try to pick ones that aren't good history, but are that aren't just good history, but are also good literature, I guess. If that makes sense? Totally does. Okay, good. <laughs> I, I always like it when I make sense by the end. <laughs> uh, so I have one final question for you today, um, and that is, do you think your grandfather would have, would appreciate two generals? Yeah, I get I get a lot of this like when I when I you know when people have read the book or maybe they've seen one of my talks somewhere they've said your grandfather would be so proud. And I can assure you that's not true. <laughs> the one person in the world who would have hated this book was my grandfather. Um, 
you know, I think he'd be proud of me. I think he'd be proud of my career. But, um, you know, I don't think he would have uh, liked, uh, you know, well, I mean, it's easy to kind of appreciate. Like, imagine if someone wrote about you, you know, and, you know, you'd, you'd immediately see all the things they got wrong, right? Um, and like I said, this was kind of personal. He did not want to be known as this guy. You know, he did not want to be known to his children as a guy who, you know, once cleaned out a German bunker with a flamethrower. He wanted to be the nice old man who, who took us fishing. So, um, you know, uh, I, I don't, I don't think he, yeah, I don't think he would have appreciated this, this intrusion to be honest. Um, so, and, and, you know, that's the kind of thing, like I, I said earlier, you know, it's the kind of thing I had to reconcile when I started doing the book and, and as I, as I was working on it, uh, you know, I had to, you know, remember I was doing this for some sort of public good and, you know, for my kids so that they could have this, uh, information all together and, and not necessarily, uh, uh, for him who, uh, who would not have approved, I'm certain. I can understand that, and I can understand yeah. your grandfather's sentiment and trying to separate his experience in the war to how his family knows him. Um, yeah. Yeah, that ma it makes sense. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I'm sure other people have told you this, but I, I significantly appreciate that you took the time and, and the emotional energy to go through this story and create this book, um, because even though I am a historian, there are always things that I need to learn. And, and the personal, the personal stories are on the top of that list, right? Is yeah. we always want to see the different experiences and, um, you have done that here. So thank you. Thank you very much. It did, this book just about killed me. Like I said, so it's, it's, a, <laughs> thank you for saying so. <laughs> Uh, so thanks again for taking us through the processes for both uh, Northwest Passage and Two Generals. And thanks everyone for coming out and those last seven who are, are still with us now. Uh, as I mentioned, yeah. mentioned before, that feedback uh, survey link is in the chat box and it will also be in the email I send out with the recording. Uh, so please please take some time and do that. I do want to also mention that in two weeks, artist and teacher Monique Martin will discuss some innovative ways to get history out onto the streets of your city. She is a Governor General's um, teaching recipient, and uh, she's very excited to participate in that discussion. So if you haven't already re registered for that one, please do. Um, this is the, after tonight, there are two more webinars in this visual history series. Uh, so don't miss out. Have a great night. Thanks, everybody.